Okay, we're ready to start our uh, next session. Uh, this session is uh, the first thematic session of, uh, of the day. The title is Tools and Workflows. It is divided into two parts. I'll take care of the first part and uh, my colleague uh, Starker will uh, take care of, uh, of the second part. This fir first part starts with uh, an interesting talk uh, with an interesting title, Baby Limatizer, Limatizer and Post Tiger for Acadian. Uh, it has been uh, prepared and uh, will be presented online. Uh, the, the preparation of the paper is by Alexis Ahala, Tero Alstola, Jonathan Valk, and Chris Linden. It will be uh, a remote presentation. Actually, it will be a recorded video. Um, and uh, most probably we will see, I mean, whether we have time for questions, it is, it is a bit unlikely at the moment. Uh, can we play the video? During recent years, Finklarin has collaborated closely with the Center of Excellence in Insert Near Eastern Empires research project at the University of Helsinki. And therefore, we have been building tools to make Insert Near Eastern text available in the digital and annotated formats for computational analysis. This collaboration was the main reason for the development of Babel Emetrizer, which is the topic of my presentation today. And in this presentation, I will give an overview of our new lemmatizer for the Acadian language that we have been using to prepare data for the Corp Concordance service hosted by the Language Bank of Finland, which is coordinated by FinClarin. I will start uh, by briefly talking about the Acadian language and continue by telling about our lemmatizer and its evaluation. Akkadian is an umbrella term for various East Semitic dialects which have been documented in ancient Mesopotamian inscriptions from the late 3rd millennium BCE to the 1st century CE. Akkadian is perhaps best known as the language of the Akkadians, Babylonians and Assyrians who dominated the ancient Near East uh, for over 2000 years. The Epic of Gilgamesh and the Code of Hammurabi are maybe the best known Akkadian texts among general public. But in reality, hundreds of thousands of texts or their fragments have been discovered, which cover various different genres, such as incantations, omens, administrative texts, legal documents, letters, mathematical texts, medical texts, and many others. And being one of the first written languages in the world alongside Sumerian and the ancient Egyptians, Egyptian studying the Akkadian language and the texts written in it provides a window to the very early days of our history. Also, converting Akkadian texts into digital text corpora contributes a lot to the Assyriological research because it allows easier access to these texts, which normally exist in hundreds and hundreds of paperback publications and as well it offers an opportunity to study these texts by using computational or quantitative methods. Currently uh, one of the largest Akkadian uh, text corpora uh, is called Open Richly Annotated Cuneiform Corpus abbreviated ORAC with over 10,000 Akkadian texts. And in our work, we have used ORAC as our training data uh, and as a guideline for lemmatization practices. The dataset that we have been annotating and why the Babel lemmatizer was created in the first place is Akhemenet, which is a corpus of Akkadian documents from the late first millennium BCE. Unlike ORAC, this corpus does not have any linguistic annotation, which makes it very difficult to use effectively. So, why do we need a lemmatizer for Akkadian? At first, Akkadian was written in the cuneiform script, uh, which was rather a, a complicated writing system that combined the use of syllabic signs uh, and earlier Sumerian logograms. The spelling conventions were not standardized, which often shows in the text as various different ways to spell the same word form. For example, in the diagram on this slide, the word forms it, the, in, it, the in, zoom in, zoom and zoom in represent or they can represent, represent the same word form, uh, namely he 
or uh, she gave. And the words are written in lowercase are transliterations of syllabic spellings, and those with capital letters are transliterations of logographic spellings uh, based on the Sumerian readings, older Sumerian readings of this sign. And Akkadians also used logosyllabic spellings, which combined the use of logograms and syllabic signs, like in the example Shum In, which consists uh, of the logogram to give in Sumerian and the syllabic sign in that represents the last two, uh, last, last two sounds of the surface form it in, he gave or she gave. And secondly, Akkadian is morphologically rather complicated language. For example, the verbal morphology is discontinuative, similar to many other Semitic languages, such as Hebrew and Arabic, which means that the stem of the word is constructed by fitting various root radicals or consonants into different patterns. And this makes various grammatical forms look very different from each other and from the dictionary forms. And it complicates, complicates significantly uh, even the simplest tasks, such as searching for a certain word from, from a corpus of texts. And in addition to the spelling uh, variation, this makes this extremely difficult. For example, uh, the dictionary form of to give is nadano, uh, which is quite different from the th third and second uh, person forms, such as itin and tatin, shown in this slide. So how does our lemmatizer work? Uh, it aims to combine the strengths of neural networks and dictionary-based lemmatizers. And therefore, we first lemmatized and post a new text by using Turku and Lopez universal lemmatizer. Uh, we use existing Babylonian texts or Akkadian texts from the late first millennium BCE from the ORAC corpus as our training data, uh, which has been carefully lemmatized by Assyriologists during the last decade. And this step gives us a, a post in accuracy of 97% but the lemmatization accuracy is only 85, um, 85%. So we need to do something for these results. And the first thing is that we override all predictions for in vocabulary words to minimize the effect of mislearned character level re relationships between the spellings of these words and their lemmatizations. And we do this by calculating the degree of ambiguity for all lemmatizations in the training data and create a file that we call the master glossary, which is simply a file of spellings uh, of word forms that have low ambiguity. And we consider any spelling lowly ambiguous if a certain lemma plus post label constitutes over 60% of all the labels assigned to it that, uh, in the red training data. And the next step is to assign lemmatizations for ambiguous word forms. And we do this by calculating co-occurrence probabilities for lemmata and the post tags that immediately precede and follow them into the training data. And this seems to be rather a reliable solutions because Turku NLP in general is able to yield a pretty good uh, post tagging accuracy of 90, say 97% for Acadian. And this step does not allow only allow us to guess the best lemma for ambiguous word forms based on their context, but it also allows us to confirm that all lowly ambiguous words mentioned before exist in previously seen con uh, contexts. We can verify that the readings are actually good. And this part is important for logograms, for example, because their lemmatization are highly dependent on their context. For example, the logogram igi uh, that uh, is a picture of an eye, is often read panu, front. But in different contexts, it can be uh, amaru, to see, inu, ai, or shibu, witness, and so on. And the final step is to use heuristic rules to find certain problems in the lemmatization. At first, we flag impossible predictions, such as infinitives that do not follow the Akkadian infinitive, infinitive patterns, 
And we also remove lemmatization of words that are too broken to be lemmatized by calculating how many signs in the original word are unreadable, otherwise marked with an X in the transliteration. And we allow lemmatizations only for words that we have 80 or more percent of the signs are readable in the original text. And we also remove lemmatizations of numbers uh, because that's what ORAC does as well. And these um, cleaning corrections are mainly cosmetic and aim to just contribute to the consistency of, of lemmatization and make it to be in line with the ORAC uh, practices. To ease the manual verification of the lemmatizations, we assign each lemma a confidence score based on the post-processing steps uh, discussed before. And this scoring aims to allow editors to focus first on the most unlikely correct lemmatizations to maximize the effectiveness of manual editing. In the actual lemmatization process, we first generate a list of lemmata with low confidence scores and sort them by frequency, which can then be fixed manually and pushed back to the master glossary for retraining the model and to improve uh, the result in each lemmatization cycle if we like lemmatize, lemmatize one text at a time. Uh, the lowest score is given to out of vocabulary logograms because they are ideographic signs that do not reflect the pronunciation of the actual word by any means. And this is because the Akkadian, in Akkadian transliteration conventions, logograms are named after the Sumerian readings. And Sumerian is not related to Akkadian, and that's why these words don't have anything to do with each other in most cases, unless they are like loan, loan words or something or borrowed. And this convention makes lemmatization of previously unseen logograms practically impossible because the relationship between the spelling and the surface form is completely irregular. However, in some cases, out of vocabulary, logosyllabic spellings may be possible to uh, predict because sometimes we might have a different word form of the same logosyllabic spelling in the training data. So the stem of the word is written with the same logogram, but it's preceded or followed by different syllabic signs for morphemes. The second lowest score is given to out of vocabulary vocabulary uh, syllabic spellings, which are something that can be guessed by learning the character to character mappings from the training data, but due to not if they are not in the training data, uh, they are not always very good. And that's why uh, we gave them a really low score. And usually this accuracy on uh, autofocabulary syllabic spelling is, uh, is around 60%. And the third lowest confidence score is uh, given to highly ambiguous words that the lemmatizer was not able to disambiguate based on their parts of speech context. For example, because the context did not exist in the training data. And the second highest score is assigned to lowly ambiguous invocabulary words, and the highest one is reserved for those invocabulary words that are also attested in a well-known partial speech context that have been seen in the training data. We evaluate the model by using 500,000 Akkadian words from uh, first millennium texts in ORAC, and we used 80% of this data for training and split the reminder uh, for development and test sets, um, half and half. And we do a uh, tenfold cross validation to make our evaluation a bit more uh, uh, reliable. We use two baseline models in our evaluation. First, a simple dictionary based script that assigns every word from with their most common lemma plus post tag uh, label based on our training data. And this model is called baseline in the table one in the slide. And as our second baseline, we used the direct output from Turku NLP without any post correcting scripts because we wanted to see how much our scripts actually contribute to the result uh, coming out from the Turku NLP. And as seen in table one, the post-correcting steps increase the lemmatization accuracy by over 10% per, compared to the baseline and about 8% compared to the Turku NLP. With lemma plus post labeling accuracy, the improvement was about similar to this, and the model achieved an accuracy of uh, 
94% compared to the baselines 82 and tour cannibals uh, 85%. Our post corrections were not able to improve the post tagging accuracy and it remained around uh, 97%. We also examined how well words categorized in the different confident classes were lemmatized and we calculate how large portion of the lemmata belong to these each confident class in our evaluation setting. The highest two confident classes consist about 95% of the total word mass, and their lemmatization accuracy was over 96%. For highly ambiguous lemmata, lemmatizations, our lemmata uh, labeled as class two in the table two, the accuracy was about 70%, and for the auto vocabulary logograms and syllabic spellings, uh, 31 and 58, uh, 57% respectively. Uh, to test our lemmatizer in practice, we used uh, it to lemmatize a subcorpus of Achaemenid, which is a Neo Babylonian corpus of legal documents from the first uh, millennium BCE, late first millennium BCE. And this dataset contained about 100,000 words and consisted of texts that were mostly out of domain compared to our uh, training data. And we first measured uh, the initial accuracy in this task of labeling words with lemmas and post tags by checking randomly selected texts worth of uh, 1,000 tokens manually, and the accuracy was about 90%. Then we tested how much we can improve the result by minimal manual corrections. And we did this by first extracting a list of lemmas that have been given the lowest two confidence scores and fixing this list manually for every word form that occurred five or more times in the corpus. Then we pushed these corrections back to the text and include them into the training data. And after this, we trained a new model with our initial training data and um, these corrections to see how much the model can actually generalize uh, from our corrections. And as a result, after fixing 3.8% uh, of the words manually, we got an improvement of 4.3% to the lemmatization and post tagging accuracy, raising the total accuracy to 94.5%, which is actually pretty okay, and it exceeds the accuracy observed in our initial evaluation done with the ORAC data. Now for the future work, uh, we plan to combine Babi Lemmatizer with our previous tool, Babi FST, which is a finite state morphological analyzer for Acadian. And this tool can be used to confirm auto vocabulary vocabulary lemmata for syllabic spellings because, of course, morphological analyzer is all able to find lemmas for word forms by parsing their grammatical elements. And vice versa, we can try to use Babel lemmatizer to disambiguate uh, this Babel FST analysis, which are really ambiguous at the moment. And now when we have a model that can predict very well the correct lemma and the post tag, we can narrow down the selection of morphological labels to those that match with these features of the um, annotation. And per perhaps we can later find some kind of statistical disambiguated model to choose the most likely morphological sequence of morphological, morphological labels. And additionally, we will experiment on different ways for disambiguating the lemmata. The part of speech based context words works uh, somewhat well, but I'm sure that there are better models, for example, based on word embeddings or sequence, um, different sequence models that can improve our results even more and hopefully bring more clarity, especially for the uh, lemmatization of logograms, which are really sensitive to the context. Yep, thank you. Uh, Alexis Ahala is actually online, but uh, reportedly with uh, an unstable connection. So if there are any questions, uh, it's better to avoid taking them now because uh, for practical and time reasons, uh, it is uh, mostly advisable. Uh, so please write directly to, uh, to Alexis Ahala for uh, any questions that you may have. So we move to the next talk.
uh, which is on uh, Weblicht Batch, a web-based interface for batch processing large input with Weblicht uh, with a Weblicht uh, workflow engine uh, by Klaus Zin and uh, Ben Campbell, and Klaus will give the presentation. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, um, yeah, uh, I'm Klaus, uh, uh, and um, I'm presenting you Weblicht Batch. Uh, this is more a um, contribution to Clarion technical infrastructure and not a research talk. Uh, it's a small drop uh, uh, contribution to the Clarion uh, technical infrastructure. Um, um, so that's joint work with Ben Camp uh, Campbell. Um, um, I'm more responsible for the front end uh, part of Weblicht Batch, and Ben is more responsible uh, for the web, uh, for the back end. And uh, that's the reason why I'm here in the front and Ben is in the back. Um, so um, let's start with the motivation. Uh, Weblicht, uh, many of you uh, might know the software, it's widely used. It's a web based tool um, that you can use to uh, create and execute tool chains uh, for natural language. Um, uh, processing. It reigns over a large tool space. There are a few hundred tools connected to Weblicht. Um, but the importance is that tool space, it's a dynamic one and it's a distributed one. In the spirit of, uh, of Clarin, many tools are hosted in many different Clarin centers um, uh, in Europe. And uh, of course, because Weblicht is so widely used, we would like to ensure a smooth uh, use of Weblicht and its tool space. We want to avoid that there are errors uh, in the processing, there are timeouts, uh, and of course it should also be a fair use. So this contribution tries to tackle that from one particular aspect. There are many things you can do, but this is the one thing that we have done uh, so far. Um, so one thing you notice if you feed Weblicht with big data, I mean, not big data in the sense of big data, but larger text files, uh, you notice sometimes that the, that the tool chain is not executed properly, it just stops. Some tool in the tool chain is just not capable of processing your input. Sometimes that's because of the size of the uh, input. Sometimes it's the content. We don't really know. Um, so um, that's something that we want to tackle, uh, allowing users of Weblicht to import larger files than it's now possible without risking problems in the uh, execution of the chain. Um, and there was also a feature request that people asked here, it would be nice if you could, if you could use Weblicht, the Weblicht GUI, for the processing of, of a collection of text files, right? Not just one file I would like to feed into Weblicht, but a set of files of homogeneous nature. Say, a dozen of English plain text files to process at once with the same chain. And that's also something that Weblicht delivers. Okay, so that's um, the Weblicht um, service-oriented architecture. Uh, on the top part, you see its integration uh, with the Clarin infrastructure. Um, um, there's a harvester, it goes to the Clarin center registry, gets uh, um, the yellow pages of all Clarin repositories. It harvests from the Clarin repositories metadata that describe web-based compatible, compatible tools, and this defines a tool space. Right? And it could be that today you start Weblicht, you use Weblicht, and you get that tool space, and tomorrow the tool space slightly changed. New tools has been added, or uh, other tools um, have been deleted. Uh, it, it happens. Of course, if you would like to integrate your tool with Weblicht, you know, you contact the Weblicht developers and you know, we try to make sure that, that your tool is properly integrated, we test it. But at some point, you know, you might take out your tool. Uh, uh, and then it's not there, or you might just put in your tool again, and then suddenly there again. So it's a dynamic tool space. Okay, uh, that's the top part, the integration of the tool space, and then there's a pipelining and execution um, engine of Weblicht that helps you that you create valid tool, tool chains, right? So if you use the Weblicht GUI, uh, you have a nice of a drag and drop uh, interface uh, where you can drag your tools into the tool chain, and Weblicht makes sure that you can only uh, uh, connect your tool to the end of the tool chain in valid ways, right? I mean, if, if uh, so far in the tool chain, you haven't created the lemmatizer, it creates your lemmas, you can't add a tool to the tool chain that depends on lemmas, right? So that's something that by the, the execution engine does, the construction of valid uh, tools, and of course it also executes the tools. 
right, one by one. It calls tool number one in the pipeline, feeds it the original input, you get output, and the output of this tool is fed into the tool next uh, in the pipeline. Um, and uh, you all know Weblish GUI, which is the graphical user interface for Weblish, but there's also Weblish as a service, where you can just uh, invoke Weblish via scripts, right? That's also possible. Okay, here you see the TCF format. That's the input and output format that tools are supposed to understand uh, that, that they should be able to read and to write. Uh, so you see at the very top um, in the TC text tag, the input, and then the tokenizer might create this XML tree about TC token. And the lemmatizer or the sentence splitter might create these XML trees with the TC sentences. So every tool contributes uh, its input uh, to the to the TCF file, and while the, the, the processing of the toolchain is progressing, this TCF file gets bigger and bigger. Okay, good. So um, as I said Webbridge has attracted a large user base. Uh, I checked the stats.clarin.eu website, um, and since 2014, we are recording its usage, and it's quite impressive. Um, the number of invocations of tool invocations that happen from inside Webbridge. Um, so usability and performance clean matter, um, but of course a smooth operation with a distributed a tool space makes it harder to always ensure that there's a smooth operation um, of Webblish. Uh, here you see the, uh, com to, the commits to master from our GitHub repository. You see, I think it states from, um, from 2012, you see that there are regular commits to Webblish. So Webblish is improved uh, all the time, uh, but that's the Weblist GUI and the Weblist chain and execution engine, you know, the tools we don't really have uh, uh, control over. Okay, so uh, one thing that we can easily do, and that's what we are uh, discussing here is, we, we just follow a simple divide and conquer strategy, right? So we have a larger input file, which is divided into smaller input files, right? Um, and then the smaller input files we send in the batch process, one by one into the Weblish chainer. We get a result for each uh, processing of a smaller file. We get uh, for each uh, input file a TCF file. And at the very end, we combine the uh, individual TCF files into a big TCF file. A TCF file which you should have gotten when processing the bigger file in the first place. Right? That's, that's all we are, we are doing in Weblish batch. So it's a really simple idea. Um, um, and of course, when you look at that, you also see that uh, it was quite easy for us to also uh, kind of um, um, realize this other feature request where users were asking us, you know, can't you allow us to send more than one file to web list? Right? Um, um, so now users can send an archive of, of, uh, of a collection of text files to web list and web list poses them uh, one by one. Okay, so now the technical details very quickly. Um, as, uh, an input file uh, is split into chunks of 100 KB. And actually we do that for text files which are larger than 200 KB. So you have a text file of 205 KB, it's split into three, into three files. Um, and it's a bit of a chicken of, of an egg problem because you have to split the files uh, right, uh, in the right way. And for doing that in the right way, putting them at sentence boundaries, you actually need NLP. And usually you would use Weblist for that, but right. So we had to do it, you know, outside of the, the Weblist paradigm. We use UDPI for that um, as a tokenizer and sending splitter to make sure that the, that the input is split at sentence boundaries. Uh, and you see these three bullet points here. Um, how we do that? It's it's quite easy and straightforward. Um, and then for all chunk, chunks we obtain, we batch process them simultaneously. Um, and actually, uh, we, we, we add a bit of error redundancy here. So if a processing of one chunk failed, we make, we make another attempt, right? It could be that some service is getting a timeout or so. So we just try again. So a bit get, getting a bit of extra error uh, um, uh, resilience here. And the three failures in a row, um, if there's three failures in a row, the batch um, uh, in total fails. Uh, but if the batches succeed, uh, then the resulting TCFs are recombined into complex TCF. Uh, and I showed you the TCF format before. That basically means you have to cope with all these token IDs. 
right? We have to adjust them again. Um, that's, uh, it's, it, it's, uh, it's not hard, but it's not trivial uh, either. So it's nice that, um, that we can do that automatically. And as a result, we get, um, we get a big T TCF delivered. And if users now submit a zip file uh, of text files, we process each part of the zip file uh, individually. And if one of those parts of the zip file is a big file, then, then we also go through the process of dividing it into smaller uh, bits and pieces. So now you can submit a zip file of, uh, say, English text files, and you get back a zip file of TCF files, where each TCF file corresponds to its input uh, file. Okay, that's the front end. Um, it's uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, you see the familiar uh, look and feel. Um, really looks like, like a switchboard GUI or like a SIMD Explorer GUI or um, 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 that's basically why we use all the code we, we had for that. So you upload your file, you select your language. Of course, all the files in your archive, if you, if you submit a zip file, should be the same language, right? I mean, we can't cope with, with zip archives where you have an English file and a French file and a Dutch file because we don't have easy chains for that. Uh, then, you, then you select your easy chain that you want to process. Uh, all the easy chains in WebList are supported, but you could also upload your own chain. Uh, because in, in WebList, when you define your chains, you can download the chains you defined. That's what users do when they use WebList as a service in the script-based modus. They have to send uh, via the script the chain to the WebList execution engine. So you can actually do it also with your self-defined uh, chains. And then you see in the table view uh, the progress. So it's, um, it's quite nice. Here I uploaded a file a bit larger than 200. Uh, uh, KB and you see three batches and you see the process and you see at which stage each process is. So here the um, turn yard parser is, uh, is being um, processed and one process uh, already finished. Okay, so um, discussion. Um, so what's the benefit of published batch? Um, uh, some users, some power users use WebList as a service, the script-based approach. Uh, but they encounter the same problems when they have large files, right? Um, uh, that sometimes uh, the tools in WebList just don't return anything sensible. So those users would need to split their file as well at sentence boundaries and WebList batch now helps them uh, um, with that. It's not, uh, not, uh, not, um, not trivial. So divide and conquer seems to be a feasible approach given that the dynamic uh, and distributed uh, tool space. So future work, last slide. Um, what we have tried uh, in the past to, to, um, to increase the robustness of WebList for, uh, for those tools which are frequently used, and these are those tools which are available as easy chains, as, as predefined chains, where, where you don't have to construct them on the fly, but they are predefined. All of those tools, they are installed locally on our services. So for this tool space, we have control over, right? That's, uh, that's good, but this is only a handful of tools, maybe a dozens of tools, but all these other uh, few hundreds of tools, we don't have really, uh, really access to. But for those tools that we have control over, of course, you can think of, of uh, kind of um, uh, scaling up um, uh, those things, uh, everything of, uh, in our, um, in our software, um, uh, Biotope is dockerized. So you could imagine that if there is a big demand for one particular tool in the tool chain, maybe you can spawn up new instances of this process uh, on the fly to account for the higher demand. And we can do this, of course, um, um, for, our, for our tools that we, that we have un, uh, under our control. Um, and of course, uh, <laughs> Having WebList batch, you, you could actually now submit very large files and get batches of many, many thousands of files. And that could really block uh, other WebList users who just have a, you know, a tiny file to be processed. Um, and that's uh, something we really have to think about uh, it now. I mean, it would really be nice if, if for instance, WebList batch could also kind of give users an estimate, uh, how long it will it take to get my job done? Right? It could look at least for the easy chains for our tools what the current uh, uh, current um, um, 
um, use of our tools is and say, you know, why don't you restart your, you know, should I restart your job at two o'clock in the morning? And I guarantee you, uh, by by uh, when you wake up, it's done. Um, and it's uh, also it's a web-based uh, um, web-based um, access uh, uh, to WebLaced. If you close the browser tab, you can always reopen it again. So whenever you use a WebLaced badge to start the process, you get some kind of ID. So you could always check two or three days later with the browser to see what the status of your of your thing is. Um, so a scheduling option would be something which is uh, which uh, would be nice. Yeah, and then there are issues like uh, often we have one bottleneck service in the chain, so it would make sense to to um, to have more processes for this bottleneck services and other other tools they just work for large import and so it might be that we have to actually take a specific tool into account, bolster the support for this tool so that the other tools just merely don't uh, get crashed by this bottleneck uh, tool in the uh, in the easy chain. Uh, so maybe complex services should be given more more CPU time um, than simpler ones. And um, uh, I had a nice discussion with uh, with Peter uh, during um, during um, um, uh, during lunch and uh, during breakfast this morning. Uh, the many other things you uh, I should have added to the future work uh, slide, but um, you can ask me about that in the question time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Klaus. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Klaus. Uh, really thorny problem, uh, the one you're uh, you're trying to tackle. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have question about this technical part. Uh, do you consider to use dynamic size of uh, this ba small batch for the different uh, tasks? For example, uh, co-reference resolution will benefit from the getting a very big context of the document and, for example, morphological disambiguation not need a lot more than a sentence. So if you, because I understand all tasks have the same 100 kilobytes uh, context, and you think uh, you can adjust this from the statistic of the uh, files on, on which uh, uh, task working on which files or the just dynamic from the some heuristics or just set up different, uh, different sizes for the batches. Yeah, uh, good thinking. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, the weak point of course is that this divide and conquer strategy only works for tasks where you can divide the work. Uh, uh, so that you have created smaller tasks, you solve the smaller tasks, and then you can create the result of the larger tasks. But what if you have to take more context into account? And we don't at the moment, right? So, so, so if you really need uh, that, the larger context, you really should not use Webly batch for that because that destroys it. You won't get the results that you expected. So, so it's not the case that the, the that the output of the TCF you get is the same output as you would have get with with this approach. It, it's something different, right? So, divide and conquer only works for tasks where we can use a divide and conquer uh, thing. So, so context is is a weak point in in, in the solution. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah, Peter. <laughs> I can't, I can't do my, my hand under my feet. Um, so yes, this reminds me, as, as mentioned yesterday, I came from the HPC uh, context and a lot of things reminds me on, on what we have done or what was necessary also to drive this big supercomputing. And we have a ni very nice discussion in the, at the breakfast. Uh, so it is monitoring of the, of the remote task is one issue I see in this, in this ansatz because you rely on, on a, lot of, a lot of things you don't have under control but you should have some information if they are available. Yeah. What is the runtime answer of that? So this should be should be a more documented uh, answer at that point. And and yes, the other point is is the divide and conquer has much to do with with parallelization in 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 HPC, um, and not each and every uh, task is parallelizable. Um, if you are 
even use this simple, the simple example of uh, counting the most frequent uh, word in a document, um, you have to be careful how to, to do it in a divide and conquer yeah. thing. Yes, but that's, uh, again, that's a thing uh, to optimize, uh, but I feel it is a very valid first uh, issue to, to tackle this responsible uh, response answers from from the remote tools in a very valid way. Yes, so there yeah. something something to do from from my point, but I guess it is the right the right to I mean, uh, start with. One thing that we do in uh, in Tübingen and there's there is a website we have. It's a monitoring website where all of those few hundred web web services connected to Weblicht are monitored. So you see the actual status, and they are green, and there is red, and there is something in between. Um, uh, and uh, they are they are sorted by uh, where they come from, uh, what kind of tasks they achieve, um, and you, and you can actually test the entire tool space yourself by uploading a text file and getting the result back. Uh, so that's already there, but unfortunately, it's not used by the Weblist chainer, right? And that would be, of course be nice, and that's what we discuss also in the morning. That before I actually propose users to attach a tool to a pipeline. Is this tool alive? In awesome, in our web interface, we know it, but the chainer doesn't use this information. And it would also kind of boost a bit the, 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 user, the user experience with, with her plate. So there is also something that, that where we have the information, but we haven't integrated it yet in the chainer algorithm. We also have a question uh, online. Uh, Jan, if you can hear us. Can you hear me? Okay, uh, I was wondering why you're splitting on sentence boundaries, which is a complex yeah, just a bit louder. Uh, I'm wondering why uh, you're splitting on sentence boundaries, which requires linguistic knowledge and is uh, difficult, and not on the basis of paragraphs, which you can see simply by looking at character terms. Uh, I didn't understand the question. The question is why the splitting is uh, done on the basis of uh, sentence ends uh, rather than on paragraphs, for instance. Oh, okay. So that you have wider context and you avoid uh, problems like the uh, one. Yeah, sentence. actually, that's also a good point. Uh, I think we just used the sentence splitter of UD Pipe. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm not aware. Is there a paragraph splitter that you can use that's off the shelf? Well, I think it's very simple. Just you can just look at character returns or, or sequences of two character returns. Yeah, yeah. Not always, eh? But uh, is there anybody from UD Pipe here? When, I, yeah. I will forward this question to the UD Pipe developers to see if there is a flag that I can set that uh, that preferably I would like to. Yeah, much as says no. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I note it down. Uh, thanks for the thanks for the question. It's interesting. Yeah, that, okay. that, that helps with the context question. Okay, uh, I think we're running out of time, unfortunately. Very interesting uh, topic. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks again. And the third talk for this first part of the uh, tools and workflow session is the Klada B Bulgarian Dictionary Creation System Specifics and Perspectives by Zivko Angelov, Kirill Simov, Petya Vosenova, and Zara Kancheva. Uh, and Petya, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, um, hi. So um, all the quotes are here. Uh, I'm only the presenter, but um, if you have any specific questions, there are two ways. Either you ask them now, or just you go you go to the bazaar later on, and uh, you can see the demo and uh, more details about this system. Okay. So um, I plan to um, talk about some um, introductory words uh, and then some related work, um, system specifics and functionalities, um, also how it supports language resources, and some conclusions and future work. Okay, 
So uh, we present the main principles and perspective behind the CLADA BG dictionary creation system, and it's called CLADA BG Dict. So maybe I should uh, start with the last part. CLADA uh, BG means the Bulgarian National Interdisciplinary Research e Infrastructure for resources and technologies in favor of the Bulgarian language and cultural heritage. So it started um, um, to be financed from 2019. I mean, many years after uh, this initiative, Clarin started, but it started as a common initiative, like um, an infrastructure that combines the language resources uh, from Clarin and also the cultural and heritage uh, from Daria. And that's why it's called Clada BG. So, at the heart of, of uh, our dictionary system lies the Bulgarian Bultri Bank WordNet. Um, I know that it is uh, discussable whether a WordNet should be lying in the heart of such a system. And uh, there could be very interesting discussions and we would be uh, very willing to hear them. But we decided that um, a, thesau a thesaurus at the heart of such a system, it's not bad because it gives the concepts, it gives the relations. Uh, and then from there, you can go practically everywhere. So uh, we view this WordNet as uh, aggregator of semantic knowledge around which other dictionaries and also other sources of information uh, can be organized. And it includes also grammatical information and also encyclopedic information and so on. And sort of we are trying to build some interlinked knowledge network uh, for Bulgarian. Okay, so what is our motivation um, to have yet another system um, for creating dic dictionaries? Um, we all know that um, it is good to reuse what is there and I will mention it in a while, but um, if, you, uh, if you want to have a better control on the consistency, the creation of lexical language resources for your own language, uh, it is better you to really have control on this. Um, also, um, we believe that uh, we have a friendly and communicative collaborative environment, um, better connections among the available resources in this. And uh, of course, we build on the best practices we know, um, because we know the systems for construction of other word nets, like, for example, the German net, Polish word net, and bull net, the other Bulgarian word, word net. However, we um, needed a system that reflects our rhythm of work, and also we need it to be really extended to also incorporate other resources. Um, functionality to provide links to grammatical paradigms, valences, links to Wikipedia, mappings to other word nets, appropriate examples, etc. So a bit about the related work. It is um, a very, um, so to say, big perspective um, because underneath there are really um, other, other, many other works. And uh, here I also can mention uh, Inguna's talk from yesterday. Uh, she shared that in Latvian Clarin, they have uh, some similar initiative of um, um, this such a dictionary system. So ours is something like that. Um, as I mentioned already, we, we follow the approaches described in two existing WordNet editing systems more closely. Uh, you can see which they are. And um, of course, I would like to mention that many efforts have already been invested in dictionary creation systems. Um, and I start with Alexis. Um, it, um, it is a really um, big um, project that ended officially um, very uh, soon now, but it continues in many other ways. And here, um, there are lexicographic workflow tools, very nice uh, because you can use them one by one if you want, and you can use them like a chain. So this is something that we aim 
uh, for and we would like to use in our further work. Uh, then I would mention, of course, Daria Eric and especially the standard about TI Lex Zero to be used, um, and also Lemon standard. And last but not least, this is the Quarineric with uh, many other tools, but also with the Lexica resource family that overviews 89 Lexica at the moment. Okay, so the system, uh, the existing version of um, this, uh, our resource was um, initiated in an XML format within the Clark system. Uh, however, the lexicographers had only a local view uh, without an underlying database over the existing Bulgarian synsets. Then we wanted to support also the mapping to Open English WordNet, and um, we needed a better support for integration with other language and knowledge resources for Bulgarian. And uh, just um, in short, the system is a client server web-based editor using a thick client model. Uh, it is installed on the server and it is accessed online via the web. Uh, the data is stored in a, re a relational database. Um, there is also a work tracking system available, which is very important and ticketing system available um, if we see that the spelling is wrong or the definition is wrong or something like this. So um, the utility of this, uh, the system provides information about a selected lemma and uh, of course the scene sets, the meanings and uh, the associated examples to it, the internal relations as well as the mappings to the open English WordNet. It also provides the ratio among the used relations. Um, in case when we have equivalent synsets, the Bulgarian synset inherits all the relations from the English synset. So it's kind of knowledge transfer, although it's not um, uh, fine grade, but it is um, uh, something to start with. Uh, the main form is literal based, or in other words, string based. Um, there is a possibility also to consult a graphical representation, related information in the available dictionaries in the system. And um, here is an interf interface that um, it is not um, um, maybe readable, but um, you can see on the left the list of lemmas and on the right uh, the selected lemma with all the synonyms and uh, these colorful boxes, you can have the Bulgarian in the blue boxes and um, uh, English in the red boxes uh, if you need these relations. But of course, uh, again, I would like to invite you to come to the bazaar where you can see more, including the graphics that I spoke about. Um, so we, we believe that in this way we support language resources. Uh, we view this system as an editor of lexical entries, but also um, as a hub to access existing dictionaries and corpora for Bulgarian, including concordances. So at the moment, um, we have uh, also linking with Bulgarian explanatory dictionary and uh, Bulgarian inflectional lexicon because we are morphologically rich language and without lemmatization, it is impossible to do uh, good uh, searches and any other work. Okay, and um, yeah, some conclusions. Um, so Clada BG Dict is an editor which could be used both for creating lexical databases like WordNets, but also uh, with about the traditional types of dictionaries. And what is more, uh, we would like to, to use it in the following way. Um, not only to, to uh, see what the word is and how it's connected to other words or uh, what examples you can find, but if you, are, if you are a user, you should be able to access all this information, to excerpt what you need and to make your own dictionary, your own resource, to select what is needed for your own task, maybe small, maybe bigger, and then uh, if you want, to uh, make it available for other people after you 
would like to use it after you. So it's really not only to check what's there, but also to use it actively and to make other resources over it. And it was already uh, being used successfully uh, for editing of more than 19,000 synsets. Uh, that were created at earlier stages and for the addition of around 13,000 synsets together with appropriate examples. And um, uh, this system is also uh, used by the Institute of Balkan Studies and um, the History Museum in Sofia. I mean, it is really meant um, to be used by people from humanities. Um, yeah, I already said some of the things to enhance replic uh, replicability and reusage of dictionary compilation, not only lexicographers, but uh, all the users that need such resource to be able to make it. And um, yeah, the plan is to use the common standards, as I said, and you see them. And um, of course, all these resources will be made available through the repository and dedicated web services. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Petya. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you very much for the presentation. It's very interesting work you are doing. And uh, uh, I would like to ask, uh, what? how do you implement the, the links to the external resources? Are there external resources with dictionaries or do you, do, uh, how is this interface implemented? Yeah, I will answer uh, myself and uh, the, the co-authors will add if necessary. Okay, uh, so uh, we did it in the way that all these um, external resources uh, become internal resources. And then there are the links established. Of course, when you link to Wikipedia, you just uh, give the URI, but uh, the explanatory dictionary and the spelling dictionary and everything is uh, internal. It's in the system. Yeah, please. Okay, so we defined our own internal formats for external uh, uh, dictionaries, and we uh, import only dictionaries that are available and can be reused in this way. So, not exactly for any kind, kind of dictionaries, but only these that can be really reused. Other questions for Petya? We do have time for one short question. Short, maybe tricky one. Uh, what about the versioning of Wikipedia? <laughs> uh, Wikipedia is continuously changing. How do you cope with the problem of, of uh, versions of Wikipedia? Yeah, uh, that is the question that I like very much because ask uh, I ask Kirio all the time how we cope with this. Uh, at the moment, we work with a dump uh, that was made and uh, yeah, I think we have to think um, about clever ways to, to face it. And if you have any ideas, please share with us. <laughs> yeah, it's a problem, I agree. Just one short operational question to both of you. Uh, you're using a relational uh, database in the back end. So, uh, and I mean, you have, I guess you already have, uh, some experience with uh, with the users. So, is there any chance of having concurrent edits uh, uh, on the lexical database? And if this is the case, uh, how do you treat this? Maybe Kirill can. Or we can. Uh, when somebody is editing one entry, uh, the other people cannot uh, enter and uh, edit it in the same time. And uh, always there is a uh, uh, back uh, uh, representation of what is done. So if there is some clashes, you can return to the previous stage and inform the people that are editing. Thank you very much. Uh, this concludes. Uh, th thanks again, Petya.
This concludes the first part of the session, and I hand over to Starkov. Thank you. Yes, I'm Starkov Barkosson from Klarin in Iceland, and I will be chairing the second part of Tools and Workflows. And we'll start with uh, Adrian Lemons. And yeah, Adrian, he is going to present a lightweight NLP workflow engine for Clarin EE. All right. Hi there. I'm uh, I'm Adrian. Uh, I'm a doctoral researcher at the Center for Computational Linguistics in Leuven, Belgium. Uh, before this, I worked as an NLP engineer in the uh, private sector, but today I work on research software together with Vincent van der Hinste, um, coordinator of the recently established Claren BE. Uh, today is all about a lightweight NLP workflow engine for Claren BE. This is actually a component of a um, in the back end of a user facer application we're uh, developing for uh, Claria Flanders. Um, so that seems maybe like a good place to start before we dive into the technical details. And speaking of technical details, I wasn't sure how technical I could be with this presentation. It's my first Claren conference. So uh, if you're the kind of person who reads Secure Shell when you see SSH, you're going to have a good time. <laughs> Yeah, you guys hijacked that acronym. Um, and if you're not, then buckle up. This is going to be a wild ride, but it's going to be fun. OK, so a little bit of context. Uh, what are we doing? What are our high level aims? We're trying to make text analytics more accessible for researchers in the humanities. This is obviously not a new theme. You know, you've probably been doing this for 10 years already. Uh, but this is kind of a new take, and it's mostly sort of focused on the Belgian researcher uh, market. Now, why are we doing this? Why are we still talking about this? Well, what we've noticed is that when we go up to, you know, researchers at our, at our faculty, it's, a, it's an arts faculty, we kind of notice that there's still quite a bit of friction when they want to use, you know, the, the tools and the Claren inventory. Um, you know, bear in mind, these are usually users with a non-technical profile. They don't know much about algorithms. They don't know how to parameterize them. They don't actually even know where to begin. And there's an overwhelming sort of choice of tools these days. I mean, good job, right? There's a lot of tools in the Claren inventory, but there's also a lot of tools that do more or less of the same thing. And it's kind of difficult to tell the differences. Um, and what we've also noticed is that sort of the needs of these researchers are more complex than what individual tools usually do, with a few exceptions, if we go a few talks back. Um, and so that usually involves some kind of manual effort to combine things. And obviously, these tools have different output and input formats. So you know, most people kind of don't even go that far and they just kind of stop and they, they, they do something else. So what are our aims? We want to kind of provide a cohesive environment for executing these text analysis workflows, right, in an automatic sense. Um, our UX kind of targets radical simplicity. I always kind of think of it as sort of Apple-like simplicity, where you really, really only present users with choice when it's absolutely necessary. We want to cover the mythical 80% of use cases. We want to export to familiar formats. So XML is great, but most people at our faculty have never heard of it. Try to avoid it. They want something like CSV that they can import into Word and or into Excel and kind of go on with their lives. Obviously, we want to reuse as many tools as possible, but we want to make it possible to collaborate with other groups in Belgium and also international, internationally on new tools and uh, workflows. And our answer to this has been to develop a text analytics dashboard application called Siku. It used to be called Manatee, but apparently that, that was taken. Uh, that's used by the Sketch Engine. It's a component there. Uh, and so I hope that sort of speakers of Dutch can appreciate what we did with the name here. Uh, no, no, no. Okay, great. Uh, and we have this little diagram here that illustrates more or less the core functionality. So it's a web app, just makes life easier for absolutely everyone, um, unless you care. Well, no, most people. Um, anyway, so the core functionality is, you know, you can upload your corpora, manage them there. You can select from predefined, so prefab workflows, uh, configure them a little bit, but not too much, right? Think this is like Fisher Price level of like simplicity that we're trying to give people. Select from these predefined workflows, uh, run them on, you know, server compute. Um, afterwards, you know, inspect the results, which means visualization and a little bit of search, and then, you know, export them. Just the annotations, not the raw data, because obviously we don't want to be used for abusive file transfers. Um, and as well, and also a summary of like, you know, the analysis and how that works so that people can actually have some trust in what they're getting back from this. Today, we're going to be focusing on just this little orange box here, which is kind of the beating heart of this whole thing. And it's how we allow um, us and others to kind of author workflows that do what we want them to do, but in a way that's a little bit generic and scales well. Uh, and that's what we're getting into today. 
quick example of what you know a user might like to do. So over here we have a historian. He's got a bunch of scans of historical documents. You know, in an initial step, OCR them, get some plain text out of there, and then in two subsequent steps, run some entity recognition on them. And let's focus on that sort of branch that goes off. Uh, that, you know, the entities are user features for a clustering task. Uh, some nationality classification, bunch that together, export it, boom, CSV, and you can go on with your life. Now, uh, pay special attention to the clustering step. Um, that's going to be important for the design of our uh, architecture in a moment. So anyway, what we need is we need a way to sort of define and execute multi-step data processing logic, i.e. workflows or pipelines, call them whatever you want. Um, we want it to be easy for non-core contributors to add workflows and components. Um, we want it to be easy to onboard junior level developers, right? We're at, a, at an arts faculty, so most incoming developers are, are kind of developing at a junior uh, level. Um, we want this thing to be cheap to run. We do not have uh, cloud credits or on-demand cloud computes. So our server capacity is relatively finite. And then back to this clustering thing, right? This kind of ties back into uh, the talk, uh, two talks back. This is the kind of algorithm where you need access to the complete data set, right? So when you process this, when you're doing this, you need access to the full data set. And so when we talk about batches here, we are talking about processors that see the uh, entire data set. And this is one of our very important aims. Um, and if you're interested in how we do this without blowing up our memory, uh, come talk to me after. It's a little technical, but we get it done. All right, so uh, building a custom NLP workflow engine. It's a, it's a fun ride, but you might be thinking, well, hold on, hold on. Uh, haven't, haven't we done this, right? I'm sure that the web linked people are, are thinking that at the moment. Well, wait, you know? Uh, and this little box here was actually a wheel, but apparently that emoji doesn't render. It's, it's a little unfortunate. Um, well, anyway, the answer to that previous question is it's a, it's a little bit, it's, it's mostly yes, but it's also a little bit of no. Um, so, okay, we've got WebLift. We got a really good uh, example, you know, introduction to that earlier. It's an application and a workflow engine. It's very tried and tested. It's established, right? 9,000 commits can't really, you know, oof, compete with that at the moment. Um, <laughs> they have, they get a lot of things right. They have a lot of good ideas, rich tool metadata descriptions, which allow them to do this dynamic sort of chain validation things. And that's something that we've also um, tried to incorporate into our system. Obviously, last time I checked, it was single documents, not batches. And we really need batches. But, you know, based on what I saw earlier, we're still in the clear because their interpretation of batch processing is a little different than our interpretation of batch uh, processing. Also, their, uh, their chains are linear. We allow for parallelization. Um, and obviously, you know, um, we have algorithms where we need to preserve the integrity of the initial corpus. So, um, yeah, it's there's some overlap, but, um, you know, there's still enough to warrant this kind of excursion into doing things on our own. Another unfortunate thing, it's a Java code base. Again, most developers coming into the field these days, they're more familiar with Python and for their career, they'll rarely need to use Java going forward. Um, and at the time for me, it was unclear how to deploy this locally and start setting it up, um, which to me, again, a, as a developer, that's a point of friction. Uh, another more recent contender is Claren Poland's workflow engine. Um, it powers, you know, their very vast inventory of tools. They do uh, support batch processing. The tools run on demand, which is also great. Uh, tools are containerized, which makes dependency hell a little hellish, a little less hellish. Uh, they have a Python API as well as several other sort of re-implementations of their API in different languages. And in fact, there are a lot of architectural similarities with the system that we're about to propose. So you might be wondering, why not use that? Well, the truth of the matter is we overlooked it in our initial survey. It's a little embarrassing, actually, um, but we just genuinely overlooked it. <laughs> um, but, 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 but there are still some subtle differences in how we kind of prioritize different parts of that. So, hey, if you're here in the audience, come talk to me afterwards. Um, I, you know, I think it's time we get to know each other a little better. All right, quick recap of our design aim. So we want to support batch processing. We want a very minimal idle footprint. This thing needs to be easy to maintain. So less code is better, less, um, you know, more sort of established dependencies is better. Uh, we want this thing to be developer friendly. Um, we want it to be introspectable by other parts of the application. And again, we're making a bit of an assumption. This is research software. We do not need planet scale, right? There's going to be about max 200 users at any time. So we can cut some corners here and there. Our answer to this has been to develop Orca NLP. It's basically a workflow engine and a Python library. As an engine, it's built on the sort of message queue architecture, which is a way for multiple processes to communicate with one another using a shared buffer. Uh, we do not need Kubernetes to, to kind of uh, run this, uh, but it is distributable across multiple machines. 
As a library, uh, clients and workers both import ORCA NLP, and what basically this does, it kind of um, introduces a shared vocabulary of abstractions that allows to wrap existing and new tools in such a way that they become remotely sort of interoperable. We focus a lot on developer friendliness. This is really one of our core sort of values, and just in the same way that we, uh, you know, um, prioritize user friendliness in um, the development of CQ. Uh, and we also ship with some, you know, extra utilities for setting up. All right, this is where it gets a bit technical. So uh, we define a couple of important abstractions. The most important top level thing is a tool set. This is basically what you know contributors would 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 uh, would make. So a tool set, it's a collection of, on the one hand, workflow definitions um, and operators. And operators is sort of a generic type of thing that can be a step in a workflow. The most common is a processor. Some people will call will know it as an annotator. It's essentially a function. It takes a data set, it does something with the data set, and it gives it to the next step. Um, how does this kind of work as a system? It's all containerized, right? Because that's that just makes life easy and it lets you reason about your resources. We have clients and we have workers. Clients issue work to the message queue. Workers pick up those uh, sort of work requests um, and they do that based on what kinds of tool sets are hosted in the worker. And then the tool set in turn delegates to different types of flows and operators. Uh, we can orchestrate this using Docker Compose on a single machine or swarm mode on multiple machines. Um, it's pretty easy and it just, it's just one less thing that people need to learn to, to use this. One of the things that we're proud about, you know, uh, remote or like distributed systems, they get complex quite quickly. We wanted to hide this complexity from people who just want to author a workflow or who just want to author uh, a new kind of processor. They don't need to know any of this. So basically what happens, suppose you're a computational linguist, you've developed a state-of-the-art tokenizer, good for you. Um, it's a, you know, a subclass of a processor. And what you essentially do in your code is you register it with a new kind of tool set. Um, and then behind the scenes, this gets registered um, or it gets turned into a remotely callable task. It gets registered with Celery, which is our main sort of Python dependency. And this allows it to communicate with the message queue. You are never ever aware of any of this happening and you don't need to be. The life cycle of a workflow, it's a little bit as follows. Client issues a request, goes on the workflow, a worker uh, picks up that task. It instantiates a so-called directed acyclic graph, which is essentially an execution plan of what needs to happen. And then afterwards, the different workers in the system, uh, the ones that are available, they pick up uh, these things and they start performing uh, work. Now, very quickly, how do you define an operator? Because one of the things that we're most proud of is our API. It's a, it's a class-based API. You essentially uh, subclass a base processor. You define your metadata as code. There is no extra sort of YAML or other kind of description format. It's just in your code. You can use your IDE to validate whether you're doing this right or not. It's in there. You can specify a config schema using Python 3.6s and up type hints. This allows us to validate at runtime and also uh, create forms for the front end. And then finally, you wrap the core logic of the tool in the call method. Um, and there's no time to get into the details here. Um, but this is basically where the, you know, where the meat of, of the thing happens. Workflows follow much the same flow. Again, metadata, metadata, config schema. And then here you have a call method that returns steps. And these steps uh, basically get compiled to an execution graph behind the scenes. And they, these steps, they express the, the sort of dependency relations between them. The interesting thing about this is that you can define workflows dynamically at runtime based on the config that gets passed in from a, an external source. I'm going to skip this part if you're interested. Follow the QR code at the end. But essentially, it's pretty easy to uh, contribute a new tool set. A couple of strengths. Um, so first of all, we do support batch processing. This thing is lightweight. Our tools only run on demand, so our memory usage is low. Our small, we are code base is pretty tiny. It's less than 600 lines of code because we're basically just pushing all the work to open source dependencies. Uh, it's easy to set up locally, and we pride ourselves on our developer-friendly API. There are clear abstractions, and a lot of the complexity is hidden. Weaknesses, uh, because of our tool set abstraction, uh, it's slightly harder to reason about resource limits. Elastic scaling is a little less obvious. Deadlocks are theoretically possible, but unobserved. Um, and um, between steps, there is a minor delay while we push these batches of data to and from remote storage. So at least for a, at least to a slight underutilization of resources, but it's, it's all right. All right, where's the code? This is an important question, right? We're aiming for an open source release in Q2 of next year. We just need to kind of clean things up a little bit, add some documentation, give some examples, and you know, implement proper CI/CD. Um, 
All right, so that leads us to our summary. Um, like I said, this is a whirlwind. This is a whirlwind of a talk. Um, so we're building Siku. It's a text analytics software for researchers in the humanities. We built our own NLP uh, pipelining engine called Orca NLP. Um, to grow our workflow catalog as quickly as possible, we want, we want it to be easy for others to contribute tools to this thing. So we've really put a lot of effort into creating a developer-friendly API. And we're aiming for an open source release in Q2 next year. QR code, bottom right, scan that. That'll lead you to the Google slide deck. There's like two times as many slides there. A lot of a lot more information. So if you're curious about how this works, definitely go there. Thank you so much. So we have time for questions. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, that will be first question about this operator. You use this uh, meta description in the field of the class and how about inheriting from other pipelines I or operators I can define. For example, I make very uh, generic operator and want to do just simple uh, changes to make very, uh, for example, a domain uh, tiled uh, operator and can I uh, create the meta information or I have to define all set again because this is the powerful of the YAML I can just use only some parts and uh, probably that's why all of the uh, software developer use this so it's my uh, consideration why you choose to put this on the class Right. That's a yeah. That's a good question. Um, so the way I see it is, what you kind of have today is that you'll have an operator, and then and an, on an external source, you might have some kind of you know description of that in a in a you know different sort of DSL for that task. Uh, and I figured, well, you know, why why split those up? Let's just combine it. Um, and then with the added benefit that if you want to inherit from that operator, then you know you can do so. Obviously, if you want to get a little fancier and, you know, you want to say override some things in an inheritance relationship, but not other things, then remember Python, it's multiple inheritance. So you can always use a mix in and, you know, cheat a little bit. Um, you can also just inherit from them and then you basically replicate the meta, uh, the meta information that's defined on the class variable of the superclass. Well, anyone who isn't into object oriented programming is just totally, <laughs> but yeah, you can do it that way. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. Of course, I have to ask a question. Of course. Um, um, so it was a very quick talk, lots of information. One thing I didn't get is, um, so users, would they need to use the kind of programming interface to define their uh, pipelines? Or is there some GUI where you construct it in a kind of drag and drop manner, like like in WebLace, for instance? So that's, an, that's, I mean, I'm really glad you asked that because I had, um, I actually wrote a point, like a note during your presentation, I completely forgot it. So that is one of the, um, you know, big advantages of WebLift at the moment that you can, that you can define these chains from the front end and that, you know, using those really rich metadata descriptions validate whether those are logical and help users to build those up. Thing is that runs a little counter to our sort of design assumptions, which is that that is way too much freedom for the average user. And, um, we should kind of guide them in a more top-down way to what they need to do because it's just otherwise it's too overwhelming there are too many different components to combine so it was less of a design priority to uh, to support that now technically speaking um one of the things that we do define in our metadata which you might find interesting uh, is that you we have a needs and an assigns field now right now needs and assigns they basically just say well these are basically the new fields that we create on the document sort of abstraction that we have that passes through these pipelines, right? Now, based on that, you can already start validating pipelines at runtime, right? Because obviously if you have one step that needs a certain field and there is no step before that that has um, provided something corresponding to that field, then you cannot build that pipeline. Um, another thing that we will, I mean, this is just right now, they're just string IDs. Obviously there's nothing stopping us from defining 
annotation types and saying that basically suppose that you just need plain text and you have a text type if you need say an entity recognition or an entity type then that can be a, a different kind of annotation and based on that we could achieve the same behavior of dynamically building pipelines from the front end using just that metadata in there because all of these classes are uh, introspectable from the client application um, using some Python import magic and stuff, but that's way too uh, technical for this. Um, but so it is possible. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, it's really an exciting, uh, exciting project. Uh, and I haven't said it in my talk, Weblicht is kind of uh, old now. It started, I think, in 2008 or nine. I think the first publication was 2010. So it's as old as the Virtual Language Observatory, which, which uh, got through enormous transformation. Uh, and, and the basic design of, of Weblicht stayed it's a service oriented architecture and we just uh, tell two developers, you know, wrap yourself as a web service and then we just send you post requests. That's basically it. And, and WebLish is just a chainer. Uh, and, and I'm just wondering how, how much work your two developers would need to do to get into your uh, chaining algorithm. But maybe I should just read up uh, what's available already on the yeah. Well, so essentially that's what's described here on this slide. You would install the library, you would uh, run through a sub number of stages, you know, in it, which will create project stru structure. You would define your operators using that subclassing sort of style of, of defining it. Uh, you would track your Python dependencies using, again, just standardized tooling. You would have to either modify, well, unless you unless you need non-Python dependencies, you don't need to modify the, the Docker file that gets generated. Uh, there's even some, some, some automatic testing. Um, and then finally, to sort of integrate with the system, Right, so in, in much in the same way that you would like integrate with Weblift, right? At the end of that, of the, at the end of that, let's hope relatively smooth ride. Um, you would push to a new remote on GitHub. You would open a PR with us, a pull request. Sorry, um, basically saying well, I'd like to modify, uh, you know, your your service or your, yeah, I guess, in your terminology, service index, so that you know about this. Uh, and then after code review by us of that new tool, we would accept that pull request. Obviously, there would be some code review. You know, it's containerized and there's a lot of weird stuff you can do with containers. So we, before we kind of pull that into our own system, into our own servers, we would need to know, okay, is this okay? And then we would, uh, yeah. But this is something that we're still working on because, yeah. Okay. So the tools run all uh, on your service then? All the tools integrated? Yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, having... <laughs> I'm more of a believer that it's best to keep everything in the same data center, uh, especially if you're doing data transfers between things. You uh, want to use kind of just the local network. It's fast. It's, uh, you know, uh, I'm also used to working on, on you know, Google Cloud or, or AWS. So that's kind of my <laughs> way of looking at it. And having things distributed over multiple data centers is just feels really weird. Um, so I've always made that assumption. We're going to be running it on our servers, giving us control over what's happening. Um, but again, like we're hoping that as much that we can um, invite as many possible other sort of computational linguists to kind of contribute tools if they want those to be um, exposed through the system, kind of in the same way that Weblicht uh, does it. Um, and now that I've seen that, you know, uh, I think one of the next steps is also to see, okay, well, what kind of web services are already available in Claren? And can we just simply, you know, connect with those? Although obviously that does mean that we would be sending data, you know, over the internet to that, which is something that we, would prefer to avoid, but you know. there are only so many wheels one can reinvent at once. <laughs> okay, thanks. So now we are gonna hear about Golem or a graph literary exploration machine. Okay, uh, my name is Viktor Vantinovich, the second one. Uh, and I would like to introduce you to the up upcoming tool uh, called Golem, a graph literary exploration machine. And this tool is being developed uh, as part of Daria project uh, in close cooperation between uh, two, uh, two teammates from this project, the Institute of Literary Research of the Polish Academy of Science and the Clarin PL team working at the Wrocław University of Science and uh, Technology. And my colleagues mentioned on the slide, uh, working on this project is Agnieszka Karolinska, Jan Wieczorek and uh, Maciej Marel. Uh, here is the presentation plan. Uh, I will first refer to the starting point of our project is uh, other tool, literary, uh, literary exploration machine called LEM. 
And next one, I will talk about uh, our design consideration, our guides to design the system. Uh, and in the next part, I will uh, briefly introduce you to the technical architecture of this workflow. Uh, and next, I will show some use cases why we want to do this, uh, to do this tool. Oh, and also mention about a resource which we parallel uh, develop called Corpus of Literary Studies uh, Discourse. And on the sixth uh, point, I have Golem in action, but unfortunately, to the some difficulties with prototype, I have to move this to the uh, next time. We have a tool called uh, Literary Exploration Machine uh, in the shortcut LAM. And this, this, this tool is created to carry out tasks uh, related to analysis of literary and uh, literary uh, science texts. It is based on the aggregation of individual tools offered by Clarin PL combined into specific user scenarios working uh, in the social sciences and humanities. Uh, like any tool, it has good and weaker aspects. Uh, let's focus first on the good ones. Uh, LAM offer uh, a lot of these use cases and methods uh, which represent uh, which, which represent to easy uh, perform this by researcher and uh, scientist uh, is offered as web service uh, which is uh, easy to use it have interactive uh, graphical user interface uh, and also uh, we can manipulate parameters of tools we want to use. It's not like you cannot change anything in this tool. Uh, uh, and significant limitation from our perspective in this tool is that still it's the black box, uh, black box uh, system. We can change some parameters, but not we cannot involve into the whole pipeline the whole workflow and how this all calculate calculation is made and also the system do not join the metadata of the uh, corpus we uh, we um, analyze and just only relay on the text data uh, also uh, have don't integrated data pre-processing uh, parts and uh, have limited size of the file to process, but it's more technical than idea uh, problems. Uh, so we decide to use this experience associated with the LAM and implement a new tool more adapted to needs of literary studies discourse analysis. Uh, firstly, we have the strong cooperation of two important centers, which are KNPL acting as provider of NLP methods and Daria Lab, which offer the resource. And as we know, the resource is the most powerful fuel for AI techniques. So it's very important. Uh, also, uh, we create the comprehensive but domain tailored uh, workflow. It's very important for us that this workflow is uh, mainly focused on uh, lit literary uh, studies discourse analysis uh, and it's very suited for this kind of uh, work. We also want to focus on uh, combining quantitative and qualitative validation, not only on quantitative quantitative validation. And I think it's very important because uh, uh, it's we can obtain the better uh, tools with very good. A qualitative validation and not only to chasing for have bigger F1 score, for example. Uh, and with this comes uh, the development of method where we want to focus also on uh, taking the important data from meta metadata and uh, important uh, of presentation with the good visualization. And this is my favorite slide because I'm more the technical guy. Uh, and on this slide, we have workflow for our system. It's uh, barely uh, depend on the Clarin PL workflow, what was mentioned before. Um, we can see the processing pipeline. On the first place, we have the entering data. And next, we use the metadata model to obtain the metadata 
provided with the data, but also uh, ex uh, external the, this uh, metadata with the information we can provide from text uh, itself. Next, we preprocess uh, our data with some sort of normalization. Also, if we can uh, define the fragments of the text uh, 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 written in the previous uh, previous times or from different uh, different uh, time period, we can use specifically tailored for this kind of text tools. Uh, and the heart of the golem is triple-R data processing components, a name entity relationship analysis component, the term terminology extraction and analysis component, and topic modeling component. And the name entity uh, relationship analysis component perform the task of the name entity extraction, name entity uh, disambiguation uh, with av the available knowledge bases, and linking entities with relations. Also, we perform coreference resolution for getting better idea what that uh, entity uh, mean. We use uh, architecture based on, uh, we use tools based on uh, transformer architecture with neural network. Uh, and this is in, in, that, uh, in that version of what we have right now, we have state of the art uh, nurse system. Uh, but also we develop it to the better recognition of uh, this uh, domain specific uh, task. The terminology extraction component use pattern search methods to extract the uh, terminologies described uh, in knowledge bases, including a comprehensive dictionary of literary terms mapped onto PL WordNet. We can also in the future working with other language and we will try to working with other word nets. Uh, the terminology extraction process cons consists not only uh, of indicate occurrences, but also of performing statistic at the corpus. And in future, we want to use a library called context to make the uh, statistic about the changing the meaning of the phrase through the time periods where when were, was uh, when this uh, phrases was used. The topic modeling component allows uh, topic identification, key phrases extraction, and stylometric comparison, uh, and it's based on clustering methods, uh, classification using machine learning, and statistical methods for comparing vector representation. Uh, and in addition to the classic techniques like LDAA. We involve semi-supervised topic modeling and contextual topic modeling uh, with library called guided LDA. And these components allow uh, us for filtering and uh, features used in the process, identification of characteristic and presentation of results. And at the very end, uh, we have visualization module aggregates this data collected in this three parallel systems and present with available methods to the end user. And also we perform annotation with this process because the data is essential, essential uh, in our development uh, process of tools uh, for development, developing tools. Uh, for more, more of most of this task, we have good generic, uh, generic uh, uh, tools, but we need them. Uh, uh, we need them uh, to focus on this specific uh, specific uh, domain. Uh, so we need to have uh, manually annotated manually annotated data. Uh, we we perform this with uh, Inforex uh, system. Uh, now I will discuss uh, Golem from the user perspective. Uh, our system was designed originally with literary scholars in mind. It should uh, find a wide range of users in Polish SSH. First, it takes into account different levels of user experience uh, from basic to expert. And like I said, we want to have involved uh, users in every step of the pipeline. We perform it like a system where we can change the outputs of each step in our pipeline. Uh, 
Uh, the web-based applications will suit both researcher uh, working uh, on small number of texts or more qualitative exploration uh, of results. And uh, we won't even have this, this is the G in the name, we want to have the visualization of uh, dependencies between the text with graph methods. As already stated, we try to address the real needs of users delivering from specific research uh, question formulate through the other research they uh, perform is the uh, on the slide we have some examples and I will go further because I make more large time than I uh, plan. And we also in the parallel process develop, develop the corpus of uh, literary studies discourse. Uh, and key, uh, this is a key resource we are currently working on, uh, and it covers text from the last 200 years. We adopt a patchwork strategy in which the KDL has three versions KDL 1.0, created by balancing and assessing the, uh, is the K uh, is KDL 1.0 have all the data and the key KDL 2.0 is selection from the KDL 1.0 by balancing and uh, assessing the data and KDL OA includes text that can be shared with wider uh, audience. Uh, as the first step, we include text from four, uh, 24 anthologies with a literary studies profile we obtained 100 uh, unique documents. Most of them were published in the first decade of the 20th century, century and the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, and I like said mention on the start, we have some problem with prototype that's also involve external server from, from Wrocław and I have, I am in connection with uh, my colleague and we're working to, uh, uh, to repair this and uh, probably tomorrow if someone wants to try our prototype can uh, get to me on the uh, corridor and I will hope uh, and I will happily to show this uh, to show to you. Uh, to sum up, uh, the operational idea behind Golem is to convince scholars that distance reading the analysis of multiple texts at once using statistical methods is uh, it's not uh, approach that competes uh, with close reading and that is useful for this kind of uh, research uh, and thank you for your attention and if you have any question uh, I will try to answer I prefer the technical question but uh, if you have a question about the idea behind the golem and how it uh, working with the literary studies it's the best way is to send the email for the Machi Mar or uh, talk on the bazaar with Agnieszka because she also have the uh, present poster presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. So any technical question? Yes. Ah, I know it. <laughs> Look, I just, I, I have to repay the favor. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, so um, you spent a lot of time on that uh, one diagram of um, the three kind of, you know, it was like three columns, there it is. Um, can you tell me a little bit of what, what's happening sort of behind the scenes there? This is a technical question. I mean, how, how are you doing okay. that? Uh, we working on the mention today, uh, Clarin PL workflow. We have different uh, different pods with uh, with uh, tools, uh, and we all we of course have the tools, but it's like a, it's a cl cloud computing system for and for our uh, process and pipeline in the uh, in the this um, aggregated modules, and this can we can do this parallel. That's why we have three groups because. Uh, for example, the word meaning analysis don't uh, don't need to use uh, the name entity recognition because it's uh, joined with uh, WordNet and they have the uh, values of meanings from the WordNet uh, database. So we can do in parallel this uh, elements. 
And it, when we have the one small block, for example, name entity recognition and disambiguation, it's not uh, in the one uh, step with entities relation detection, but we want to uh, that the researcher can verify each step. We want to lose a lot of error pro error propagation because it's a lot of tools. So if each uh, tool have, for example, a three three percent error rate, we will have a very big error rate on the end. So we want to involve the researcher to the uh, make some uh, make some uh, repair in the text, changing the annotation or filtering some of information. If someone only wants to get information about statistics of the city mentioned, they don't need other geolocation information. Uh, so we won't have involved uh, researchers in this process. All right, cool. Thanks. Thank you. So, any more questions? No, then just thank you again. Thank Excellent you. talk. And we go for the third and last talk. It's Valeria Pozzi, who's going to talk about Epilexo. So, hi, I'll try to shorten a little bit the presentation, given that it's almost. <laughs> Uh, lunchtime. I'm Valeria Kwaki from the ILC, and this is co wor um, work uh, in collaboration with my co-authors. And I will present a platform that we developed to support uh, ancient historical linguistics. So a little bit of context. This work is uh, funded and carried out within a national project funded by the Ministry of Research in Italy. And uh, it's about the languages and cultures of ancient Italy, trying to combine traditional approaches, philological and epigraphic approaches to more uh, digital models and uh, methods. This is in collaboration with two other research units uh, of historical linguists, the University of Venice, which is also hosts the principal investigator of the project and the University of Florence that deal with the actual data. Uh, the project is also supported by Clarin Italy. Um, with, uh, so the project will provide resources, services, and software will be deposited to the Clarin uh, repository. And Clarin offers us hosting services for the servers that are needed to run the application. So what are those languages? So we deal with languages of ancient Italy before the Romanization period. So very ancient languages, uh, sister languages of ancient Latin, the focus is on these four uh, ancient languages as demonstration, let's say. Uh, the peculiarities, these are uh, so-called Restsprachen, that is uh, languages with very fragmentary attestations. We have very few texts existing ever <laughs> uh, that can be found and analyzed. Uh, these texts are highly uh, um, damaged, so the knowledge that we have of these language systems is really precarious and partial, and they are mostly or almost exclusively attested on uh, epigraphies, so inscriptions. So this is an example of the text that we are dealing with in the project. Uh, the goal of the digital part of the project is to uh, build an ecosystem of interlinked resources that will help uh, scholars uh, exactly encoding digitally the knowledge that they have of these language systems. And so the three core uh, data sets that we are going to handle are uh, epidoc uh, editions of the text that they are studying, so corpora. Uh, lexica for these languages that will have to be build, to be built from scratch in the project, and this will be uh, LOD compliant, so uh, based on Ontolex Lemon, a data set of bibliography relevant for the studies of these uh, texts. Uh, plus, there will be uh, there are links to common shared vocabularies, as in the is in the tradition of uh, epigraphies. Um, and uh, we also want to link especially the lexical resources to available external resources, possibly uh, available in linked data format. 
Why we do this? That, well, we, we all know the advantages of uh, uh, encoding digitally uh, the knowledge also of historical and ancient languages. Uh, most, uh, mostly we wanted to foster future cross-disciplinary approaches and therefore try to uh, advance the, the sector and uh, at least start encoding digitally and publishing online these resources. So the first step that we thought it was actually needed is uh, to have a, a collaborative editing platform that is easy to use because our end user historical linguists are uh, quite uh, skeptic about technology and uh, often not very uh, digitally uh, skilled. So this is what we set up to. And we devised this Epilexo platform that we call. Uh, so Epilexo allows to manage at the same time uh, uh, lexica, so to build them and create lexical information, link it to the text and to the bibliography. This is not completely new work, so we basically uh, base this work on an existing tool that is uh, offered by the Clarinet Consortium, the uh, Lexolite tool, which was a full stack uh, editor for building electronic dictionaries and lexica compliant to the Ontolex Lemon uh, model. Uh, but this work is basically a re-engineering of that work plus an enhancement. And how? So uh, we uh, try to um, uh, design the system uh, in a, a server-oriented architecture or as uh, to use the details work, uh, API-based design. So uh, the, the, the platform is actually the front end, the, 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 the interface. This is developed in Angular and uh, calls services offered by several backends. The two main backends are one, the Lexo server offering services uh, for uh, lexicon creations and linking and linking to the bibliographies. The other is a server for managing text files, importing files, importing their metadata, importing the annotation presence in the files and allow for interlinking between uh, all the resources. Plus we have, we use uh, out of the box, the APIs from Zotero to link to the bibliographies and a key clock for managing users and permissions. Uh, so I will basically <laughs> skip the technical architecture just to show that it's uh, quite, um, the, the idea is that the both uh, servers, the, both backends have been designed to be modular, as modular as possible, which uh, uh, on the one hand allows for uh, adding new uh, services, new features uh, and functionalities in case they are needed and to uh, um, allow the exposing very atomic services as that can be briefly seen in the documentation. For example, the Lexo server exposes atomic services for each and every function uh, related to lexicon management and creation. And the same goes for the cache servers managing annotations and, uh, um, and texts where annotation are complex objects that can specify any number of features in addition to the basic attribute value pair so that um, it should be as general as possible to be reused possibly in different contexts. So our goal was to take the opportunity of this project to build something that could be used and useful for in other scenarios, uh, maybe not to end users, but useful for programmers. So this is just an example of how some of the services offered by the two backends are used in combination. Uh, the platform allows, among other things, to create, uh, to, to link um, word forms to their testimonies in the text. So uh, in the uh, upper left corner, uh, the user can see the list of texts that have been ingested into the system or can ingest a new text. Then in the central part, the reconstructed tokens uh, in the text are shown and can be linked to the forms in the lexicon. That is, can, so, so the, the tree can be seen in the bottom left part. And, um, and uh, Clicking, so establishing the link automatically creates, and uh, uh, so in the back end, it's an annotation. In fact, it's an attestation. So, of these, for example, uh, token OOPSED, 
which can be, uh, the attestation can be further enriched with additional metadata and information about, for instance, the confidence, how certain this attestation is, or um, the user can add additional bibliography to support this uh, hypothesis, let's call it like this. So this is how we can create links between uh, uh, text and lexicon elements. Uh, another interesting feature that we added is exactly linking to external resources. And uh, so for this project, the backend has been configured to uh, query directly the Sparkle endpoint offered by the Linking Latin project so that we can link directly externally to another uh, resource available on a Sparkle endpoint. And we use this, for instance, for the etymology and etymological information in order also not to uh, ask our historical linguists to redo basically work that is already has already been done in uh, available dictionaries. They can, for instance, link the etymology for UPSED to the, uh, uh, to the LILA knowledge base to the etymology of the Latin opus. Or uh, this can also be very useful for uh, the uh, uh, etymological roots. So in this case, for instance, these uh, Proto-Indo-European roots can be linked directly to the root available in the etymological dictionary uh, published uh, on the LILA uh, endpoint, and therefore avoid to repeat or re-encode the same information. And in this way, we also allow for creating real linked, da linked data sets. So um, the practical implications, so Epilexo can be seen as one of the possible applications that can be built on the uh, services offered by the backends. And uh, so the work has just started, but we already have two small uh, examples of different and independent uh, front ends that use the Lexo server, so the lexical services. One is by Colombo et al. 2022 that built this visualization um, application for um, browsing and navigating uh, a semantic lexicon of Italian. And the other, Giovannetti et al. 2021, used the uh, Lexo services for uh, performing query expansion within a text search. So this is uh, future work. We still have one more than one year to go to end the project, and we now have a lot of work to build the exploration platform. So, um, which we are still thinking whether to base it on the existing uh, platform or make a new front end. So basically for cross querying all the different resources, visualizing the results and uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that our end users would like. Then we will have to publish the data set on um, a Sparkle endpoint plus depositing it in Clarin uh, uh, repositories. And also we have a question of uh, uh, how to deal with images. We will have a small set of drawings done by the uh, linguists working in the project, uh, which the, then will be, let's say, copyright free on a, with, with an open license. Uh, but they also have links to images on in, hosted uh, in museums. And so we still have to sort out what is the best way to use them. And then, of course, we will need to have uh, download and export functionalities to uh, allow users to download the data in different uh, formats. Certainly, we need to, uh, to, to provide a lot compliant formats. The Lexicon and Lexo is already compliant with Ontolex Lemon and implements all its core modules plus some uh, extension. And then we would be interested to see whether uh, the backends are really useful for different uh, um, front end applications. So, with this, I conclude my talk. Thank you for your attention. These are mm, some of okay, you can find some details of the code on GitHub, and there is also a demo version of the platform that you can use.